Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, members and guests of the AAES. Hope everybody is having a fabulous first day in the much awaited Birmingham meeting. So uh, before the alarm goes off, let's do one more round of applause for that. My name is Mira Milas, and thank you for the privilege to be your vice president this past year. In that role, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to present to you your president this year, Dr. Cord Sturgeon. I would like to share with you the story of who is Cord Sturgeon in the various ways that you know him, expert and gifted endocrine surgeon, husband and father, colleague and friend. And we will begin and conclude with how, he, how we know him best, uh, which is in the context of endocrine surgery. So Cord is currently professor of surgery, chief of endocrine surgery, vice chair for regional integration for the entire department of surgery at Northwestern, where he has been a faculty member for nearly 20 years, a phenomenal achievement by itself. He holds these additional leadership roles across the Northwestern healthcare system, a top 10 hospital and a Chicago medical icon. Cord started his endocrine surgery career at another top 10 icon, UCSF, completing his fellowship in 2004. What an amazing company of authors to join in this paper, his first career paper in endocrine surgery on the topic of pheochromocytomas. Uniquely, prior to UCSF, all of Cord's educational heritage was rooted in the University of Illinois. So Cord's scholarly contributions are extensive and impactful and have made a difference to all of us in this audience. He is a beloved teacher, mentor, gifted surgeon, and has served our society in numerous roles over the years. But his daily contributions are equally impressive they make Northwestern's endocrine surgery world vibrant. Along with his wonderful surgical partner, Dr. Dina Elaraj, and soon to be a new third partner. Thank you, Dr. Elaraj, for your wonderful stories and photos shared for this presentation. And in sum, for this section, I would share with you that Cord gives his heart and soul to surgery. And like Chicago's Miracle Mile, he goes the extra mile. Being a husband and father is likewise the joy and foundation, the heart and soul of Cord's life. I would like to express deep appreciation to Mrs. Jane Sturgeon for the beautiful stories and photos you shared and the time you gave me. Cord's family is here to celebrate with him this magnificent honor. As the spouse of a surgeon, you have supported Cord's career and your own career, and that makes you an honorary endocrine surgeon, potentially a Cope Meritorious uh, Award winner. <laughs> And I hope the following slides do right by your amazing family. Cord and Jane, his beloved of 24 years, have built a beautiful life together and a beautiful family. Saying daddy's home means more to Cord than anything else. He is exceptionally proud as he should be of his talented and lovely daughters, Kate and Cassidy, who even contributed original artwork to the AAES auction 
and enjoyed visited the Metropolitan Museum and shopping on Fifth Avenue with Cord when they were in New York last year. Cord's parents and sister can be most proud of Cord as well. They're a tight-knit family, as you will see in subsequent photos, and I learned a few cool things along the way. I learned that except for a very short stint in Tennessee, Cord is an Illinois native through and through. I learned that he had fabulous hair once upon a time. <laughs> I learned, I learned how papers uh, really get selected for the AAES program and what happened to my abstract back in 2013. <laughs> I learned it's priceless to come home and get a hug from a pug like this one who's a character and a good sport to be featured in uh, daily Facebook posts that, Co that Cord makes. And most of all, Cord, I learned that God blessed you with a super cool family. And hats off to all of you for that. Well, to usher in this next section entitled ESPN, The Sports Station, uh, you see Cord taking a selfie with a snowboard. And this section will start and end with bicycles. I couldn't help but notice the chiropractic sign in the background and in a, another country. And the biking occurs over continents and glaciers and clouds and in the amazing company of Cord's father. And occurs over back roads. And then there's remote nature hiking and marathon running and more running, horseback riding, skiing. All of the ESPN sports are covered by the Sturgeon family. They cover them all. And by this point, when I got this collection of photos, just making these slides and looking at the exercise, I burned 500 calories and I closed all of my iWatch rings. Uh, but wait, there's more. So, Cord and his family are not just sports fans. They are diehard sports fans. I think Chicago folks must understand this profoundly, uh, but it is just deeply ingrained in the identity. Mike Ditka is his godfather. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and in this amazing annual tradition, Cord and his father go to the Indianapolis 500 yearly, I counted it as my weekly exercise allotment. And I was just really asking the only logical question to ask at this moment, which is, are y'all for real? In my best Texas accent. And then I got this photo. And borrowing the phrase from Dr. Heller to just pause and take in the scene and the artwork from the morning, um, I understood. I understood the connection of all of the dimensions in Cord's life. Um, and the answer is yes, he's real. They're all real. It's all real. So I wish to collectively thank <laughs> uh, all of Cord's many colleagues and friends in the audience who made sure I would have plenty of material and who love and admire you, Cord. So many offerings. I'll let you soak in this section too. Gifts from patients, Cord's OR DJ playlists, the Las Vegas slot machine settings 2121 on the Bowie machine I cannot unsee. <laughs> the winning entry in my best 
goiter whisperer voice goes something like this between Dr. Yang and Dr. Sturgeon. Wow, that's a big thyroid. That goiter's got to go. It's just got to go. Wow, he's gone. Oh, yeah, he's gone. Turns out that Dr. Sturgeon loves music and is a tremendously accomplished guitar player. This is from the retreat last summer. He is a regular at Lollapalooza, has an amazing guitar collection that rocks, pun intended. And with your next president, Dr. Solorzano, who is an amazing singer, as I witnessed last night, he will be opening for Keith Urban, Metallica, Lady Gaga, and the Chicago Blues Festival this summer. So just keep them on your radar. In short, Court is no stranger to concerts. Whether he's the one on stage, or whether he's the only person of a certain hair color in the mosh pit, or whether he is roping in past presidents to be drummers. Dr. Labuti is not confirmed yet for the summer opening act festivals. And I have come to witness that Accord really brings life to all of the occasions and celebrations and meeting and leadership and roles he has. He enjoys world travels with his AAES friends and with his family. You do not need to go to the travel channel or to National Geographic. I highly recommend just going directly to Cord's Facebook page and you will get the tour of the world and all of the foodie and visual enjoyments that our planet provides. Uh, and that Facebook page may soon perhaps feature Cord's next travel plans and you can ask him to show you what socks he's wearing today as a testimonial to that. To conclude, I wish to emphasize how Dr. Sturgeon has worked tirelessly as your president and great leader. And in conjunction with the officers and councils and committees and the Birmingham hosting team, uh, all of the various initiatives that he has taken with the AMR, with the friends and family that you see in the photos, Court has tackled all sorts of important initiatives and has really thoughtfully compiled all of the themes of this amazing meeting in Birmingham. Roots gives, give wings, roots give wings for sure. Um, and saying it best in the final slides are Cord's colleagues from his San Francisco roots. You can see Dr. Shen's heartfelt message, thank you Dr. Shen, who admires your thoughtful and caring way, Cord, of doing the right thing. From Dr. Su, thank you Dr. Su, you see the words where your talent, your spirit, your inclusion of others, collegiality, curiosity, uh, reflect the best of you and bring the best to our society. And to conclude, uh, with and from Dr. Kwan Du, with a story of gratitude that his family gave blessing and approval to share, of how in the overlapping Venn diagram that brings us all together in this room, one day the person that you trained may be the one who cures and saves your nearest and dearest. So thank you, Kwan. Thank you, Dr. Du. In your words, Dr. Surgeon is the real deal. 
He makes us all proud. And yes, I trust Cord with my own family. Perhaps the greatest compliment uh, and recognition a surgeon can ever get. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your president, Dr. Cord Sturgeon. I'm gonna give you a hug, hold on. Not supposed to start out crying. That was great, Mira. Thanks. Oh my God. Um, thank you, Mira, for an unforgettable introduction. Um, uh, I'm just going to try to bring it together here. Okay, here we go. I hope everybody is enjoying this meeting so far. Um, this meeting is a great opportunity to see the scientific method in action. I was just thinking, I'm sitting here watching all these talks and people are coming to the microphones, and you may not agree with everything that's presented, but you can come to the microphone, you can discuss it in the open, open forum. That discussion, by the way, is, is published as part of the permanent proceedings by Keppel. You can read it in 20 years. It's always fascinating to go back and see what you said 20 years ago. Um, it's just a, a great opportunity to see it in action. Also, this is a great place um, to come up with new research ideas and maybe even more importantly, to come up with collaborations where you can work with other people to further your research ideas. And so I urge you all to uh, take this opportunity, you know, today and the next coming days to, to do that. Um, I'm going to start by verbally outlining my talk to you. Um, first, I'm going to start by telling you a little more of who I actually am, not the stuff that you just heard that was amazing, but, but the real stuff, I think. And then um, I want to go through the three themes of this meeting in some detail just to tell you what they are and why we're doing them. And then um, I'll follow up with a call to action or, or inspiration. And um, I really uh, trust my, um, my officers to be honest with me. They tell me things that, um, that I don't want to hear, like your humor is too dry, or you don't tell enough stories, you should tell more stories. So, so I'm listening, I'm taking that feedback. I'm going to um, try to illustrate all of the things I just mentioned by telling you a series of stories, okay? Um, being your president ha has been the honor of my professional life. I feel so fortunate to have this opportunity to lead this amazing organization. It's been uh, inspiring, it's been humbling, it's a great source of pride, and um, people say that the hardest part about being the president is giving this speech. But the hardest part for me was cutting the speech down to about a hundred slides, <laughs> and to try to do it in an hour or less. And, and today, to be absolutely honest, the hardest part is going to be getting through the first 15 slides and, um, and not losing composure during that time. So bear with me, I know you're pulling for me. Uh, in order to do this, I'm gonna tell some amusing stories um, and to start out, I'm gonna thank a bunch of people. So here we go. All right, I wanna start by thanking the most important uh, people in my life, beginning with my beautiful wife, Jane. Um, terrible timing, we met a month before match day in the spring of 96. As I think you saw, I had a BMI of about 22, a full, hair, a full head of blonde hair, I did. Not much has changed, not really. <laughs> this little princess arrived in uh, 2005 and so then it was Jane and Kate. And uh, gosh, it wasn't much longer after that. Princess number two came. And uh, uh, fellas, you know what I'm talking about? We moved from the zone defense to the man-to-man, -man, which is considerably harder. And um, here we are now. I took this picture about a month ago in the Florida Keys. I know what you're thinking. Um, when you see a picture like that, Sturgeon's in huge trouble. <laughs> His curls. 
Anyway, this family um, has been my inspiration, my support uh, throughout my whole career. I couldn't have done it without them. I love them so much. For my kids, I want this especially for you, despite everything that you do, no matter how hard you don't want it to happen, you slowly turn into your parents. Am I right? This uh, woman, June Sturgeon, she was a nurse for 35 years. She's mostly my mother, I shouldn't say it. She's my mother, and she was a nurse for 35 years. Um, many dinner table conversations, uh, stories from the OB and neonatal units where she worked when I was growing up. Uh, she taught the teen pregnancy class at the local community hospital. She did neonatal precepting for uh, the local nursing school. Interesting story. She taught, as I said, at the local nursing school, and because of that, most of the nurses I work with as a resident knew my mother and had her phone number. <laughs> True story. And so they could let her know if I had a particularly grouchy attitude about anything on any particular day, and that's, that's pressure. That's pressure. Uh, this is uh, the elder Dr. Sturgeon. <clears throat> Here we are at the Tour de France, uh, thanks to the Dutch. Are any Dutch in the, in the room? We got some Dutch? Look at the Dutch. Thanks to Menno. Here we are in Utrecht at the Grand Depart. Uh, my father and I are obviously both into biking. You see the shirts. Um, my, my dad's a PhD psychologist with a basic science background in psychopharmacology. And when I was a kid, he was a postdoc at the University of Chicago. And I remember taking the train up to Hyde Park and visiting his lab and seeing the rats that he was doing brain surgery on. Right, surgery, right, surgery. Um, interestingly, I think we both spent about 10 years of our lives in basic science labs. And he's also an accomplished writer and editor. And uh, in fact, he still offers his editorial opinion on my papers at age 81. Eventually, he involved he evolved into a clinical psychologist and is an expert in a wide range of psychometrics. So it should be no surprise that my research trajectory was similar, basic science and then psychometrics. So from my mother I got my love of medicine and my dedication to medicine. My father contributed these things as well. This is uh, Peggy Peterson, my stepmother. Her superpower is cooking. Do you know that when I was a teenager, I actually believed that all high school students were being taught to mise en place and to make things like chicken cordon bleu and bolognese sauce and stuff like that. She had me totally fooled. Um, and those skills actually came in handy, especially in like college. Uh, she spent most of her career as a hospital administrator, something that ironically I'm now getting involved in. And so it was totally unbeknownst to me until I was actually preparing this talk and making these slides, how I have become a combination of these three people. This is the, the way my career has gone. So I thought it was fascinating. All right, I want to tell you a little bit about um, the early kind of years. And uh, I went to the University of Illinois, as I think you heard already, in Urbana-Champaign in 1987. And as a freshman at the University of Illinois, I joined the lab of David J. Shapiro, and um, coincidentally, his dean is in the office, er, here in the audience. So uh, I promise you, uh, all the stuff I'm about to tell you is true about David. Um, I'm not cleaning it up because the dean's here. Anyway, ironically, it was a biochem lab interested in endocrine hormones, yeah, endocrine, specifically um, estrogen regulation of gene transcription. And um, what was really striking about this, I spent four years in his lab but I realized like right away that he had an eidetic memory, a, a photographic memory. And um, I was the lowest guy in the totem pole, and uh, uh, this is kind of the stuff that I had to do. He would call me to his office and he would say, uh, I need some references Xeroxed at the biology library. There was no internet, FYI, it's 1987. There's no PubMed, okay? There was this thing called Index Medicus. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Anyway. So I would come into his office with a notepad, and he'd be sitting at his desk, and he would say something like, uh, right off the top of his head, um, there's this article on estrogen response elements. It's in Cell, 1984. 
um, volume nine, turn to page 96, left hand side, halfway down, first author is Smith, they're from Hopkins, I need that paper. And then he would do it again, and he would do it again, and I would be like furiously writing these things. And so then I would run to the uh, biology library, which is halfway across the uh, campus, I go to the stacks, I pull cell. 1984, volume nine, turn to page 96, left hand side, halfway down. I'll be darned. There's the paper, right where he said it was. And, I, and then over and over again. And I couldn't believe it. It was like he could just see it in his mind. And this was, mind you, this was the first professor that I ever uh, knew in college. And I really was under the impression that all professors had an eidetic memory like that. And I thought, all right, just take that one off the list. There's no way I can ever be a professor. It's never going to work out for me. But uh, it was actually due to David Shapiro that I went to medical school. Like David uh, had me in his lab for four years and really encouraged me and taught me a lot about science. And because of that, I think that's really the, the, the main reason why I actually got in. Um, I got to uh, medical school, and uh, I should mention David is the guy in the blue uh, circle in the middle of that screen on the right-hand side. And when I got to medical school, I joined another lab, and uh, the picture on the top right is that of Bill Law. I joined the combined labs of um, Jim Ferguson and Bill Law. They're in uh, biophysiology, uh, biophysics and physiology. And it was in this lab that I learned the scientific method and the importance of clear presentation of your results from the podium, answering questions from the podium from the audience. And it's where I did my first oral presentation. And, um, and Jim, uh, I don't have a picture, he died at a young age, he was a tremendous mentor and he taught me a lot about mentoring. And these individuals probably were the most important in terms of my research education uh, after college. I think you may recognize the individual on in the lower left-hand side, that's Lloyd Nihus. He was a emeritus professor when I was in medical school and also when I was a resident. And uh, he encouraged me to become a surgeon. And uh, you may be familiar with the Nihus classification of inguinal hernias or his work with the stomach. Um, but uh, when I was an intern, I operated on inguinal hernias with him at the VA. We did exclusively Bassini and Cooper repairs. There was no mesh in those days. Uh, and uh, he was really uh, quite an inspiration to me as a medical student, encouraged me to be a surgeon. And to be honest, there's so many others that I should put on the slide that deserve to be on the slide that I just don't have time or space to mention. Uh, but I saved the best for last. The person in the left upper corner is Dr. Olga Jonasson. She's a pioneer in surgery. She was a general surgeon, a pediatric surgeon, and a transplant surgeon dedicated to surgical education and a powerful advocate for women in surgery. She possibly had the most influence on me as a resident. Once a month, she would invite the surgical residents to her house. She would make dinner and drinks, it's like spaghetti, and she would pour wine and stuff like that. And then she would spend two hours in oral boards style questioning to the individual residents. And um, it was, I mean, that was important, that was good stuff. And it was on one of those nights that I said to her that I was interested in endocrine surgery. And you know what she said to me? She replied, I am very impressed with Quan Yang Du. I think you should get to know him. And wow, she was right. She was right. All right, so the next couple slides are a guessing game for the audience, OK? So um, I'm not going to give it away. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the first endocrine surgeon I ever saw. So the first, I mean, I'm, this is the first endocrine surgeon I ever laid eyes on in my life. And uh, this is another pioneer and strong advocate for women in surgery. I was interviewing for residency in 1995. I was at a cocktail mixer the night before the interview. There was this massive crowd surrounding one obviously very important and influential person. Picture this, okay, a crowd of people I ring like two, three people deep and with this very animated figure in the middle. And I had to see who this was. You know, who is this person? And I, I made my way over, and I'm trying to, to get a glimpse of what's going on. And uh, I had to see who was holding court. And uh, it was this person, <laughs> Dr. Sally Carty. Um, 
I'm going to admit something right now. That night, Sally, I was too scared to talk to you. <laughs> too scared to introduce myself. And I'll, I mean, it was like a superstar or something. And it, so although she was the first endocrine surgeon I ever saw, I didn't actually meet her until years later. OK, next one. I was on a flight from uh, LA to Chicago after presenting at a meeting. And I sat next to this very pleasant gentleman. And we spoke for an hour or more before getting to the point where I said that I was a surgical resident. And he told me that he was an endocrine surgeon. And I wasn't quite sure what that was, you know, or what that meant at the time. And so he told me, he told me. And in fact, to my chagrin, he then informed me that all the endocrinologists at my hospital were sending all the thyroids to him at his hospital across town. <laughs> and uh, there was a good reason for that. And the reason was that he was Ed Kaplan. And uh, it was probably the best thing uh, for those patients. But um, the, pa the pattern of, re I shouldn't have said that. The pattern of referral, by the way, uh, continued until his recent retirement. And we've become uh, good friends. I miss Ed. OK. Um, the first endocrine surgeon I ever saw operate. I was a chief resident. I made a phone call to this endocrine surgeon to talk about becoming an endocrine surgeon. And uh, he was quick to invite me up to his hospital uh, to spend the day with him in the OR. And on that day, he did a total thyroidectomy followed by a Whipple. I was pretty hooked. I, I could see myself really loving that kind of practice with uh, this kind of an amazing partner. And at one point, uh, he almost convinced my wife and I to move to Milwaukee. I mean, we were really close. Uh, it was such a, he's such a great man, and uh, he's, he's been a great friend ever since. But something happened. Uh, the interview, the Orlo Clark interview. And so um, I arrived at Dr. Clark's office for the interview probably before 6 a.m., like 5.45 a.m. No big deal. That's like 7.45 Chicago time. So we talked, and he got to know me. As maybe you've heard about the way he gets to know people. And he, he wanted to know who I was and what, was, you know, what my life was about and stuff like that. And uh, he had, you know, standard interview questions, too, and everything. But we talked for quite a while. And then he said, OK, let's go around. And so uh, we saw his four post-op patients, all, by the way, closed with these huge Michelle clips that he used. Do anybody remember this? With a giant um, bandage that went, like, from behind the back all the way across the neck through the axilla on both sides. That was pretty cool. I saw four people like that. And then... Uh, <laughs> Then we went to his research lab, I meaning he was probably seven, and uh, I was able to hear about all the stuff that was going on. It was all basic science at that time. And then uh, we went to clinic, okay? And so clinic starts at eight, 20 patients from eight to noon. Uh, a reasonable lunch break, like a burrito, I think is what he usually had. And then we came back, 20 more patients from one to five, so 40 patients in that day. And I just coattailed him the whole time. I stayed on his, uh, just on his back. And in that one day of going to clinic with Orlo Clark, I learned more about endocrine surgery than I had in my entire life. And I was really hooked. I was really, really hooked. And after the interview, he said to me, um, what are you doing this evening? And I, of course, had nothing. I mean, I flew in from Chicago. I don't know anything about San Francisco. I got no plans. So he says, well, um, why don't you come to an art opening at my daughter's gallery downtown San Francisco? I said, OK, let's do that. Sounds good. So um, we go to this art gallery. I'm just some nobody, you know. And he says, oh, do you know Cord Sturgeon? Do you know Cord Sturgeon? He's like introducing me to all these people, his family, random people from the community. So um, we're drinking wine. Um, and then he introduced me to Carol. Carol, Carol came in. And uh, Carol says, uh, what are you doing for dinner? And I said, uh, no plans, you know. And she says, well, why don't you come to dinner with uh, me and Orlo? And uh, so we went to dinner, and we had two more bottles of wine. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> at the end of dinner, I'm like begging for a job. You know, I'm like begging. <laughs> the rest is history. Uh, nobody interviewed like Orlo Clark. So this is an amazing time in my life. Uh, my fellowship mentors, who made me who I am today, were Drs. Clark, do and Kabeba. Um, back in those days, Gita Lau, Gita's in the audience, she showed me around. I showed up, Gita Lau is the outgoing fellow. Uh, my chief resident 
Michael Ye. Uh, my four, Jenny Ogilvy. My two in the research lab, Wen Shen. You already heard. Uh, when those were the days, weren't they? Hey, do you remember when? Do you remember running that crappy, rainy, cold half marathon in Golden Gate Park? We're freezing to death. Those are good times. Oh, do you, wait, wait, wait. Do you remember the time that uh, our wives were cornered by that black bear in Yosemite on the trail, and you and I were off goofing around on Half Dome, and they almost got eaten? Uh, good times. I really miss those days. And I miss, I miss Orlo a lot, I really do. I, I miss those days very much. At the uh, halfway point of my um, fellowship, Nadine Crone joined us as co-fellow, halfway through. And at the AAS meeting that year, which was in Charlottesville, Virginia, Orlo asked me to interview a promising young resident named James Lee. Good times. Um, Peter Angelos, who isn't here today, is a family um, health issue. Um, Peter took a chance on me and offered me my dream job back in Chicago. And I thank Peter for being a great senior partner and really launching my career and giving me the responsibility and the opportunities that I really needed at that time. The first partner I recruited was Dina Elaraj, and she's been my teammate for 15 years. And let me tell you something. The most fun that you'll ever have is watching Dina Elaraj take me through a laparoscopic adrenalectomy. <laughs> Dina, I know you're in the back. They, we should turn that into a podcast, like a comedy podcast. Tony Yang was one of our finest residents, and uh, he went off to Anderson, and, and then uh, we were able to eventually recruit him back to Northwestern. He's done a tremendous job uh, this year as our program chair. Um, unfortunately, we had to file a missing persons report because he went to Indianapolis a few months ago. It hasn't been seen since, though. So if you see him, send him back. I, uh, I gave an impromptu speech at ESU two nights ago. Um, that's one of the things that the president has to do. You get this impromptu speech thing. And uh, one of the themes that popped in my head was that fellowship classes grow up together now like a family. And I think it's more true now than ever before. They're really close-knit. It was true before, too, and to demonstrate, take the case of the endocrine babies. Um, these are two key players in my fellowship, Wen and Nadine, like I just mentioned, and through some miraculous confluence in the span of two years, these five new human beings arrived on the earth. Evan and Kate came pretty close together. They're both starting college this fall. Evan, University of Toronto, I just found out. Kate, University of Florida, go Gators. Then Aaliyah, who is probably going to be in the Winter Olympics, is my guess, pretty soon. And then uh, Elena, and then Cassidy is the one that's really sad that I'm holding in my arms. Good work, team. This is, a, this is how our family grew up. I have another story to tell. Um, <laughs> it's all stories. In 2010, uh, the annual meeting was in Pittsburgh. And Sally Carty was the local arrangements chair. And the president was Janice Pasika. And I was sitting in the audience listening to the presidential address, learning about the famous Canadian physician, uh, Sir William Osler. And I have to confess, in those days, I wasn't sure if Janice liked me. <laughs> and during her speech, she put up a slide of her friends. And it seems really silly to me now, but. Um, at the time, I was really surprised to see a picture of me up there. Um, that moment really changed things between us, Janice. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so I have like a similar, you know, picture, friend picture thing here. Um, so for all my friends out there, I apologize if you did not appear in these pictures. Um, but on the other hand, if you do appear in these pictures and you're not at this meeting, we are no longer friends. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. All right. We're still friends. Um, I don't know how long I can stretch out this part of the speech, but uh, if you don't find yourself, I assure you that you're still my dear friend or mentor, or mentor either way, or both. Um, And this is one that I wanted to talk about a little bit. Uh, we, we saw a lot of pictures of people playing guitars earlier. 
And uh, this is uh, the legacy of guitar players. You can see Jeff Moley here playing guitar in Nashville. And not now, but if you remind me later, I've got a great story of when Jeff Moley and I took Sam Wells to a Red Sox game, so I don't have time for it right now, but oh, so much fun. And um, I, for I forgot, but there was a time in my life where I didn't wear glasses. Do you notice that in these pictures? I'm not, I'm just realizing now that um, I'm not wearing glasses in almost all these pictures, and I think I have the same tie. Well, anyway, let me just move on. I just want to say I have tremendous gratitude for these amazing people who helped me run this organization this year. Barb Miller, Tracy Wang, Keppel Patel, Mira Milis, and your president-elect, Carmen Solizano. Here we are in Chicago at our um, annual retreat. It's so much fun. I had a great time putting that on. And so speaking of Carmen, what did we do this year? And I know those pictures look like we travel the world and we have lavish banquets all the time. We're drinking a lot. But sometimes we just get together and play guitar, right, Carmen? That's what we do. Like this brand new Fender acoustic available at the auction Sunday night to the highest bidder. <laughs> Played by two presidents, not one, but two. So in this next part of the address, um, I want to talk to you about the accomplishments from this year and why I think they were meaningful and, and why we should push forward with many of them. All right, so you know about the agenda, but I'm just going to start out by revealing my hidden agenda. And frankly, yeah, it was to do less. It was to do less, but to do it better. Um, the, what I mean by that is that we're going to identify areas in the organization with redundancy, with overlap, uh, where um, some uh, of the um, committees need more help or they need to find uh, deliverables and give that to them. So that we're all kind of working smarter and we're working in an aligned fashion. Uh, and that's what we spent uh, a lot of the first part of this year doing. Uh, also, I wanted to um, help out the uh, uh, AAES Foundation and try to uh, get more involved with them and to ramp things up uh, a little bit more. I wanted to um, refresh uh, CESWIP and I think you're going to hear about that on uh, Monday morning, about how we've uh, done things to improve uh, or change, I think, the governance. And then, um, probably most importantly, uh, set up Dr. Solorzano for success so she could hit the ground running when she takes over the reins of this organization. What we actually did this year, um, we needed to clean up a few things, amp up some others, start up some new initiatives, and join up with our partners. So. Um, starting out with the cleanup, we um, decommissioned the Global Surgery Committee, changed to a task force that's kind of just changing the way that it works so that it can actually be more longitudinal. Um, we are in Birmingham, so that means the end of Mission Birmingham, so um, the individuals on that task force will be redirected to others, and other task force may be uh, developed in the future because of future needs. We renegotiated our contract with Elsevier. Uh, that was uh, Keppel doing that, and we got a great deal. We got more support from them, uh, and some things were clarified to put us in a much better situation. We confirmed Nutrition as an accredited AES fellowship, and we refreshed the SESQIP governance, as I mentioned a minute ago. We increased the DEI committee involvement with the annual meeting, specifically by uh, getting them more involved with the program committee and the program and being involved with judging the posters and the DEI session. We started the focus practice designation process with the American Board of Medical Specialties, and we would more than doubled the support of ESU thanks to the foundation. We initiated the Pan Am Task Force. We initiated the Quality Verification Program Task Force. We initiated the REMAP project, project, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. We created the first health equity scientific session at our annual meeting, uh, which, is in, which is tomorrow. Um, we also created the first Latin American session, which I encourage you all go, to go to. It's a lunchtime session. We joined up with the ACS Cancer Surgery Standards Program and uh, just the other day joined the ACS Coalition on Surgeon Wellbeing, which ties in with what you saw today with ergonomics from Gita Lau. So we did all of these things, and, and there's a few others that I couldn't add on this slide. So when you become president, people ask you, what's going to be your legacy? What's going to be your agenda? Um, well, my agenda was kind of to just change the way we think about presidential agendas. 
I wanted to change them from single term agendas to maybe three to five year projects with buy in from multiple presidents. I'll give you a few examples. So Herb and Alan started the DEI projects within AAES and I wanted to continue to fuel them. I wanted to move them down the field into scoring position. And Tom started the Pan American project. I wanted to take the ball and advance it down the field. And I wanted to kick off the leadership project so that when Carmen took over, it would be up and running. And if you're not tired of football metaphors at this point, I would add that, these pro that when these projects get to the red zone, we don't want to settle for a field goal. We want them to have enough support and effort behind them to get a touchdown and maybe a two-point conversion too. These are the three themes for my presidential year and for this meeting. And I'm intentionally displaying them as a Venn diagram because there is considerable overlap and synergy. And you'll see these themes recapitulated uh, over and over again at this meeting. So I want to take a few minutes here to discuss uh, each of them. So I want to start with um, health equity. Uh, the first question to ask is what health equity goal should we set for AAES? And we need to look outside and inside the organization for those answers. You know, are there a group of patients that have been excluded or marginalized that are within our sphere of influence? Uh, looking internally, how can we attract a more diverse fellowship, membership, and leadership? Can we use the scientific program to encourage investigation into equity issues? Obviously, yes. Can we start to propose solutions, perhaps even more importantly? How can we go to Birmingham, Alabama and draw inspiration from the historic fight for racial and civil equity and apply those lessons learned to health equity issues and our energy to fight them? These are two reasonable long-term goals for AAES, improving the outcome of our patients regardless of SDOH and attracting more diversity to our ranks. To address these goals, we need tactics, and a few are listed here, including identifying populations with disparity, identifying the drivers of health inequity, and acting upstream interventions that address the problem whenever possible. A number of tactics have been employed already for the goal of improving diversity, specifically the self-nomination process that Barb was encouraging you to engage in earlier today. Um, this is a process for committees and also for council at the end of the year. Uh, policy and procedures are modified to block nepotism, to reward service, like we do for selection of moderators, uh, the mentorship program, et cetera. We're, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, we're increasing DEI committee interaction and involvement with the program committee and the REMAP project that I'm teasing you about, we're going to talk about in a minute. To encourage and highlight the scientific investigation and equity issues, we created this special scientific session on health equity this year. I think we had 53, 53 abstracts submitted to compete for five podium slots, 53 for five. And the winner of the best paper will receive a $1,000 cash prize from the AES Foundation. Your, general, your generous support of the foundation made that possible. And in the January issue of surgery, we're going to have editorials accompanying the equity papers to deliver context and to suggest next steps. Tonight, following this address, there'll be a presidential reception at the Civil Rights Institute where you can learn more about the struggle for racial and civil rights. And on Monday, the Honorable Senator Doug Jones will give us an inspirational address on the importance of fighting injustice regardless of the perceived difficulty. It's a lofty goal to propose upstream changes to address health inequities, but we will consider those proposed at the presidential panel on Monday after Senator Jones, and then also at a future strategic retreat. So with this model of goal-directed leadership, it's important to connect tactics to the overarching goals. And here's an example of just one uh, potential uh, health equity uh, goal and underlying tactics, there are many potential health equity goals. Many, there's really many populations that deserve our attention, so this is really just one. Um, the goal here that's stated is to achieve health equity for endocrine surgery patients in underserved communities. And the objective is to increase the number of fellowship trained endocrine surgeons practicing in those areas by 20% by 2025. 
The strategy is to increase the feasibility and desirability of working in rural and underserved communities. I've already started talking with chairs of departments uh, who are interested in this type of interaction with our organization. We can partner with hospitals, we can partner with healthcare systems to create more lucrative and supported opportunities for endocrine surgery fellowship graduates so that we can maybe eliminate some of these deserts of care that exist in the United States and elsewhere. So the second project I want to talk about is the Pan American Project, Pan American Cooperation, Pan American Outreach, Pan American Partnership. Um, a lot of different terms have been used for it this year. The goal is to increase engagement from outside of the U.S. border, including all of the Americas, um, all of South America, all of the Caribbean. Um, the Pan American Task Force was created this year in order to start working on this project. And um, along with Carmen, we uh, appointed Denise Carnier Pla and David uh, Velasquez Fernandez as the co-chairs. And you can see that um, they created a, a task force or workforce, sorry, uh, that's very diverse um, to address some of these issues. And there are the names uh, just beneath the co-chairs. Um, here's where they uh, are on the map. You can see that they're across the Americans. Yeah, we don't have anybody from Greenland. We're working on that. Um, but uh, uh, you do have a chance right now to, to self-nominate for this task force. And I think right now we have pretty decent Pan-American representation for the area that we're targeting first, which is South America. One of the uh, tactics was to send AAES leaders uh, or members to meetings in Central and South America. Uh, and here is uh, Merida, uh, Mexico in the Yucatan uh, Peninsula. Uh, we were able to send uh, some leaders down there this year. Uh, thanks to David uh, Velasquez and Miguel Herrera. Here's um, Janice Pasica at the podium uh, talking about parathyroid disease at that meeting. And I think it went over spectacularly well uh, it, was, um, it was actually just an amazing meeting. Uh, and in turn, we invite leaders and members of sister organizations to attend and participate in our meeting here today. So you know we had distinguished moderators, we have panelists, we have course instructors from across the Americas, and we will have the first Latin American session in Birmingham uh, at this meeting. The future of the Pan American Project uh, is uh, to um, uh, create uh, content that's appealing uh, to the Pan-American audience. Uh, we um, are going to do that by first reaching out and surveying them and finding out what their needs are. Um, the task force has envisioned using webinars, tumor boards, guidelines review. We've already um, created a way to translate our entire website to Portuguese or Spanish or frankly any other language that you would like. It is active now for that matter. And, uh, and specifically I want to just repeat that at this meeting we will have the endocrine surgery and Latin American sun ses uh, lunch session on Sunday and also the Latin American meet and greet Sunday at 6.30 p.m. So back to connecting tactics to overarching goals. The goal here is to increase engagement for endocrine surgeons across the Americas. The objectives, I would state we should um, try to double the number of AAES members that we currently have from Central and South America and the Caribbean by 2025. Our strategy would be to make it easier, more worthwhile, and more desirable for them to join the AAES. The tactics, some of which I've already uh, mentioned, establishing the Pan American Task Force, determining the needs of that population, developing relationships or, or strengthening relationships with the surgeons and entities in those target regions, and developing educational content that is appealing and useful for them. The third uh, is the leadership project. The goal for this project is to leverage AAES connections and talent. Uh, to cultivate leaders. Uh, we have a number of different ways that we're doing that currently. Uh, uh, the, and I'm gonna go into each of them. The mentor program is essentially for early uh, career. Remap is early academic career. Visiting professor is early to mid academic career. And the leadership course is mid to late uh, career. And uh, we're doing all of these things right now. I just wanna tell you a little bit more about each one of them. The 
uh, AAES mentorship program actually launched last year. It launched in 2022. It's part of the Career Development and Leadership Committee that's run by Sonia Sugg. And um, th the entire framework of that mentorship program is available on our website. And it's here, but it's too small to read, I apologize. But everything is laid out to develop a relationship between a mentor and a mentee through our um, uh, membership here. And it's, uh, it's been a very nice program. We want to continue it and move it forward. The REMAP program is the Reviewer Mentorship Academy program. Uh, this is directed by Keppel Patel. Uh, it is based on the Association of Women's Surgery uh, model, uh, which is developed by Caitlin Hicks. It is actually a partnership with two editors-in-chief, uh, the uh, editors-in-chief of the journal Surgery and the American Journal of Surgery. It's a didactic uh, course. Uh, it lasts for a year. We have 10 mentors and 10 mentees. They uh, go to each of these didact didactic lessons that teach them how to formally review manuscripts. And then, Keppel assures me, they will each be reviewing three manuscripts for the annual meeting, but with three different mentors. And um, when you finish this process, this one-year process, you graduate from it, and then it is understood through our connections with surgery and other journals that it will be widely recognized as um, the, uh, the, the go-to people when you need people to join your editorial board or become a junior uh, editor. So this is an important uh, program for young people who have academic aspirations. And uh, it just launched. We did our first session. Uh, and I think it's going really well. We'd like to expand it next year. The next one is the Visiting Professor Program, again, launched last year, not during my presidency. Uh, this is also under the Career Development and Leadership Committee, so if these things sound exciting to you, self-nominate to that committee, please. Sonia Sugg is the chair. Our inaugural professors and sites are listed uh, in the second panel, and the third panel we have our 2023 professors and sites. Tony is going to Vanderbilt, Vanessa is going to Medical College of Wisconsin, and James is going to the University of Iowa. And we'd like to expand this. This is a great way for our young faculty, our young academic faculty, to get in front of people and give talks and be get recognized for the fine work that they're doing. The next one is um, the leadership course. I, I uh, hope you had a chance to attend this. Uh, this was two days before this meeting. It was a day and a half course uh, called Competitive Strategies and Leadership Tactics for Endocrine Surgeons. It was run by uh, Herb and myself, and you can see the faculty was entirely drawn, except for one person from the membership of this organization. I've started to get the feedback from this course, and it was really outstanding feedback. Everyone loved it, and I think it was a great opportunity for uh, mid-career, mostly, individuals to gain some additional uh, knowledge on how to move forward with their um, leadership plans. And finally, I want to add this one here. All these projects that I'm talking about, mentorship, remap, visiting professor, all these things, they involve our senior members as well. So it is yet another um, opportunity for a more mature career. Uh, individual to uh, get more involved and, and uh, particularly with mentorship and teaching leadership uh, to our uh, younger um, members. Okay, so finally, connecting the tactics to the goals here. Our goal was to leverage AAES connections and talent to cultivate leaders. We want to increase the number of AAES members in leadership roles, and I'm just going to throw out 20% by 2030. I think it's a decent goal. We want to build leadership experiences and skills of our members. And the tactics that we're using are remap, the leadership course, visiting professorships, the mentorship program, and also the networking that we do at this meeting uh, every year. OK, that brings us to the intermission. We're at the halfway point of this presidential address. This intermission was brought to you by the AAES Foundation. It was made uh, possible by your tax-deductible donations to the foundation, which is a certified 501c3 organization. Just absorb it here, this moment of cuteness. All right, let's move on to the rest of the talk. <laughs> so like I said, three themes. 
uh, to this year leadership, uh, equity, and uh, Pan American partnership. And so for um, the rest of the uh, talk, I'm gonna focus on uh, equity. And there are, there are many very important health equity issues that are worthy of a call for action. And I considered a lot of them, um, climate change, gun violence, the absolute assault on women's rights and autonomy that's happening right now. I mean, these are just a few issues that demand our attention, but because I did not pick any of those topics, it doesn't mean that they're any less important. I, I want to focus on an issue that is fully within this organization's sphere of influence. And so um, you heard a little bit about this from Ben James today, and I'm going to tell you just a little bit more, but less data, uh, more inspiration. So we're going to talk about financial toxicity and survivors of thyroid uh, can uh, and survivors of thyroid cancer and also other cancers as well. And this is a call to action for practitioners and societies. Uh, I'm going to start out with a couple of uh, definitions uh, that I'll use just to the words that I'm going to talk about during this part of the talk. Financial burden, that's a material condition, definable in currency, uh, one million US dollars, something like that. Financial distress, on the other hand, is a psychological response a response to the burden. It cannot be expressed in currency. It's more like how much stress or concern or worry somebody has. And financial toxicity is a combination of the material and the psychological. It's the combination of those two. Don't be confused by terms like financial hardship. There's a legal definition for those and I have uh, no interest in reading legal definitions to you so I won't do that. A couple of key points. The first is the probability of financial burden in patients with a cancer diagnosis in the United States is about 50%. A number of studies have shown that. Uh, it's kind of a staggering number. 9% of adult Americans, that's 23 million adults in the US, owe medical debt. 11 million of them owe more than $2,000. 3 million owe more than $10,000. And as of 2019, America's collective medical debt was, over t was probably around $200 billion. So it's not a trivial amount. It's a very significant number of people. Where does it come from? Uh, you heard a little bit this morning about out-of-pocket costs. This is actually very important. Cancer survivors report higher out-of-pocket -po expenditures than uh, people who don't have a cancer history. But there are a few other things too, a little bit under the surface that are harder to, to get to. Productivity loss, in uh, one study, labor market earnings dropped by 40% after a diagnosis of cancer. Family income dropped 20% three years after a diagnosis in another. Unemployment rates in another study increased 9% at three years from the time of diagnosis with no recovery for patients who are alive in years four and five. Asset depletion occurs. In some studies, between one-third and 80% of cancer survivors have used up their savings to finance their medical expenses. And then, of course, you recruit medical debt. 1.2 to 3% of cancer survivors file for bankruptcy protection in the first five years after diagnosis. This was an eye-opener for me. The uh, Federal Reserve uh, came out with this a few years ago. This is pre-pandemic. 40% of Americans can't cover an unexpected expense of over $400. That's not much money. $400. Um, uh, cash they don't have. And you can see from this data that they're going to payday loans, they're borrowing from a friend, they're putting on a credit card, they're going to pawn shops, stuff like that. It's, a, it's pretty impressive that that percentage of the population was not able to um, cover $400. One in four Americans say that they or someone in their household had problems paying medical bills in the past year. There's a number of uh, studies that show the financial toxicity is associated with worse health outcomes, and, and not just in thyroid, but in all cancer patients. There's uh, studies for lower quality of life, increased symptom burden, less satisfaction with care, and in one study uh, by the Ramsey Group, cancer patients who filed for bankruptcy protection had an increased risk of mortality compared to those who did not. So pretty significant um, consequences. Now, I'm here to tell you that thyroid cancer patients have the perfect storm for financial toxicity. And I think it's worthwhile to kind of dive into the elements of the perfect storm to understand what's causing that. So the first is that the costs and charges uh, for treating thyroid cancer, and specifically for thyroid surgery, have outpaced inflation 
and are predicted to continue to rise higher than that of any other cancer site. There's some historical data between 2006 and 2014 that after correcting for inflation, uh, the annual increase in the median patient charges for thyroid surgery was about 4.5%, and that's an increase of nearly 40% over nine years. Uh, members of this audience have published papers looking at attributed costs, 15,000 at one year, five-year attributed costs, 25,000, estimated lifetime costs nearly $35,000. This is a recent publication from Marietto uh, from 2020, where they look at the charges and costs for the various cancers that are prevalent in the US population, and they look at the cost predictions uh, over the course of time, 2015 to 2030. They have ranked the cancers on the x-axis from those that will have the, the smallest amount of increase in cost to those that will have the highest amount. And look at where thyroid cancer is. It's all the way on the right-hand side with a predicted 55% increase in costs over that period of time. Thyroid cancer has the highest one. Out-of-pocket costs are high for thyroid cancer patients. This is a little bit harder to explain. Um, the cost of uh, care for cancer patients can be roughly broken down into three basic phases, uh, initial phase, continuing phase, and end of life phase. And for most cancers, as you can see on the left-hand side, the majority of the total cost, about 70%, are at the end of life. Thyroid cancer is the inverse of that. About 78% of costs are in the initial and continuing phases of care. So all the costs, all the money that we spend, all the charges are at the time pretty close to when you make the diagnosis and do that initial treatment. Remember that out-of-pocket costs are a major driver of financial burden. And for thyroid cancer patients, 96% of out-of-pocket costs are in these first two phases, not at the end of life. They're in the first two phases. And because of the young age of thyroid cancer patients, they are not on government insurance like Medicare during these phases. And so the out-of-pocket costs are not trivial. This is part of the reason why the average age of onset is 50 uh, for our thyroid cancer population. I think we're all familiar uh, with this picture. We see this every year. It gets published in CA. Uh, all of the various types of cancer that we have in the United States along with the prevalence. I'm just going to erase um, these numbers and replace them with uh, the same exact um, cancers, but the average age of diagnosis right next to them. And so what you can see is that um, thyroid cancer has an average age of diagnosis that's one to two decades earlier than all the other cancers that occupy those top spots. So it's about 50 years. Um, so all the other cancers in these top spots, except for breast cancer, impact retirement age Americans. Thyroid cancer occurs much, much younger than all these other ones. This is uh, from Searstat, the mean age of diagnosis is 51. The, um, about 20% of all cases of thyroid cancer occur in retirement age adults. Uh, so the vast majority uh, are in the younger than 65 uh, population. Opportunity costs are high for thyroid cancer patients as well. This is um, a recent study in uh, JNCI on opportunity costs. And again, it's like that other study I just showed you where they rank all the different cancers across the x-axis. And you can see I've also put the mean age of diagnosis at the top, just above the blue bars. Um, thyroid cancer, again, all the way, almost all the way on the right-hand side of the chart. That's because these are working age adults who are normally in the workforce, who are normally paying down their loans and accruing um, wealth, instead being uh, put into a situation where they are now unable to work, can't pay off their loans, and they're accruing debt. So it shouldn't be surprising, as we learned earlier from uh, uh, a, a talk this morning, that thyroid cancer survivors have a higher rate of filing for bankruptcy protection than survivors of other cancers. In a recent study from uh, the state of Washington, uh, patients diagnosed with thyroid cancer are more than twice as likely to file for bankruptcy protection as patients without cancer. So 2.2% versus 1.1% in the study. In addition, they found that most patients who file for bankruptcy did so in the first year following the cancer diagnosis. 
The thyroid cancer appears to place patients at an even higher risk of bankruptcy than any of the other cancers, number 3.5 times higher than persons who don't have cancer. And this association might be partially explained by the fact that thyroid cancer patients are at risk for lost wages because they're not able to work in the perioperative or postoperative period or in the time surrounding radioiodine ablation if they are getting that. Um, furthermore, due to the young average age for thyroid cancer, these patients are more likely to have a high debt to income ratio, are less likely to have access to high quality health insurance, or more likely to have these high deductible plans, and they don't qualify for Medicare or Social Security benefits. So to conclude, I feel like we need to talk about what can be done. I'm not trying to be political or anything, but I do want to talk about state and national policy because this is a highly debated thing. We have to, we have to look closely at what they do. Um, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare in 2010 did all of these things that uh, I put here on bullet points. And there are numerous papers that have identified Medicaid expansion as being a dramatic benefit to uh, patients getting care. There's two new ones though I want to highlight. The price transparency legislation is a big deal. And um, the No Surprises Act was just uh, signed in January of 22. I was asked by Jen Kuo the other day um, what's come out from that. It's a little bit too soon. Uh, the No Surprises Act should help uh, reduce the number of services that are considered not covered by insurance. And then the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, which is um, the one that allowed for drug price negotiation. That actually is really important because in the United States we pay about three times more than anyone else in the world for uh, chemotherapy and other drugs. And so it's important that we're able to negotiate those prices down for our, uh, for our patients. At the provider level, I think what you and I need to do uh, more on a daily basis is ask patients if they want information, to advise them about options, refer them to professionals like financial uh, navigators, uh, we need to think about improving the frequency and content of discussions on the cost of care and the risks of financial hardship. Uh, and here's the thing about it. When you first diagnose someone with cancer and you ask them if they need help or if they're having financial hardship, the answer is probably no. They're probably fine. It's when you're treating them when they've gone through surgery and radiation and chemotherapy and other things, that's when the debt is accruing, that's when they're not going to work, that's when they're imperiled. And that's when we need to ask again. We need to be asking them over and over again in a longitudinal fashion to understand how, how their treatment is impacting their financial situation. Um, looking at cost, cost transparency, it's a little controversial. I think it's worth looking at. And we need to select treatments whenever possible that minimize lost wages and reduce the chance of losing access to employer-based insurance. We need to um, treat cancer rationally. And um, there's a ton of talks at this meeting that I think uh, start to address that and think about that. We've been talking about active surveillance and or passive watchful waiting for a number of years now. And we need to use those when it's appropriate to do so uh, for uh, patients. We need to limit the extent of surgery when it's appropriate. And we've already heard uh, one paper today where the authors proposed maybe doing RFA and surveillance uh, as opposed to active surveillance in perpetuity without RFA. I think it's worth looking at. Um, lobectomy plus five years of surveillance, is that cheaper than active surveillance in perpetuity? These time horizons of perpetuity, of course, the answer is that the costs continuously add up. It needs to be studied in a more rigorous way. We need to scrutinize uh, costly surgical adjuncts that may not add value. So some robotics may be in that category, remote access surgery, and especially add on cosmetic procedures. I think all these things are adding to the cost burden of patients, so we need to be very careful about employing them and thinking about what they're really doing. We need to employ rational surveillance strategies, like not seeing them every two months. You know, we need to be think thoughtful about how often we do these things and we need to leverage telemedicine because it reduces travel burden and lost work. We need to limit the frequency of tests and we need to employ lower cost options when appropriate as we heard at the ATA uh, in, um, in Montreal. We need to um, be more uh, embracing of generics because there is a major cost difference for many patients. And for this audience in particular, 
we need to avoid all complications. And complications are really the thing that hits the quality of life and hits the cost the most. So when we avoid complications, we do the best. And so I would propose that adjuncts that minimize or prevent complications ultimately are going to be considered valuable and should be thought of as such. We've all been talking about diagnosing less thyroid cancer. Um, sounds like a terrible idea the first time you hear it. Uh, but goal, the goal for this is to avoid diagnosing cancers that are unlikely to be clinically meaningful, like some papillary microcarcinomas, as we heard earlier today. And by, doing, by saying we're going to diagnose less, this means we're not screening for thyroid cancer. We're setting rational thresholds for FNA. We, we don't biopsy under certain thresholds, like in ACR tyrads. We need to codify these things in guidelines, uh, rethinking the terminology like NIFP. And I'm often asking myself, must my pathologist call out this incidental one millimeter PTC inside of a goiter? Like really, um, you know, the implications are pretty significant. I've been talking this whole time about doing less, but I want to put in a plug here that it's exactly the opposite for hyperpara. It's exactly the opposite. We need to diagnose and treat more primary hyperpara. I have no data to show you, but this is, the, when we do not treat hyperpara, people accumulate disability, they accumulate misery, they accumulate cost. That's when they get fractures, immobility, loss of independence. That's when they have kidney stones, kidney issues, increased costs, more surgeries to clean out their, their, their stones. I mean, so it's exactly the opposite. We need to be diagnosing and treating more hyperparathyroidism, and I'll go one step further and I'll say we need to do that close to where they live. We need to do it close to home because there's a significant burden on them traveling to get these things done. And remember, almost every study that we've seen over the last four decades has shown that only 20% of hyperpara is being treated in the United States. All right, to conclude, what can professional societies do for thyroid cancer survivors? We can write guidelines with financial toxicity in mind. We are in the business of writing guidelines now. This is something that we rarely have on top of mind when we do it. We need to start doing that. We need to advocate for expanded health care coverage. We need to train physicians who will provide expert care close to where patients live. And we need to empower patients and providers with education so they can provide the best care. Forgot to advance the slide, sorry, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna, uh, this is the last slide. I wanted to end with um, something from Orlo Clark. I asked a lot of um, Orlo Clark trainees, you know, we're operating, and you hear him, you hear his voice, you know, you hear it in your, in your head. Uh, and he says little things, because he said them over and over again as he was training you. And I find them very valuable. I find that wisdom has stuck with me, and it's, it's very important. And, um, one of the most common things that people told me that they recall is him saying, treat the patient the way that you would want to be treated yourself if you were lying on the table. And whenever I think like that and I do that, I always do the right thing. So I thank you, Orlo, for that advice. I thank you for your attention. What a uh, wonderful address, and um, I think in the past hour you've seen a snapshot of what the entire year has been like. So it's been a lot of stories, <laughs> a lot of fun, um, and a lot of work. I think we've gotten a lot done this year. And so on behalf of the membership, I want to congratulate you on your leadership, your attention to detail, and your broader vision for the future of the organization. Um, you've continued on the initiatives of past presidents. You've initiated your own, and we'll see those tomorrow. Um, and I want to um, congratulate you on your, your dedication. That's been evident throughout all of the roles you've taken on through the AAES. Um, you are incredibly important to this organization. I also want to say thank you to Corey, to your family, um, because uh, for sharing him with us. Uh, hopefully you've, you've understood how much he means to us. 
Um, so we have a few gifts for you. Um, do I have my, yes, we do have slides, great. Um, I'll let you have that okay. for now. All right. Okay, so this is the fun part. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work this year, and uh, that started out with um, right after the last meeting, looking at meeting expenses and the mm -hmm. budget. That was fun. Um, yeah, that was fun, right? Was so to walk into, no. <laughs> um, and so much so that after the retreat last year that you and I stayed after, and on a whiteboard, we calculated the cost of one cup of coffee out of one of the large hotel coffee urns, True. right? Yeah. yeah. So um, it is expensive. Very expensive, it's ridiculously expensive. So uh, savor every drop, uh, don't waste any, okay? Um, and I don't want you to, we don't want you to worry about that anymore, okay? okay? Good. Um, so uh, we didn't, you know, it's a little bit too big to bring down here and have you take back on a plane. So we shipped something to your house um, and it will be waiting for you. And um, we got you your own coffee urn. <laughs> that is customized with your uh, name in bling, okay? So that you can now bring us coffee yeah. to all of our council meetings and all of our meetings so you don't have to uh, burden the society with the cost of coffee. That's good. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, I'll do all right. And uh, I do want to say that you're, um, <laughs> the other thing we know is that you are a cyclist. So we have gotten you a custom-made AAES jersey with your presidential year on it uh, so that you can, when you're out, you can advertise for the AAES. All right, bring us in some patience. I might wear it tomorrow. Please do. I thought maybe you'd wear it tonight to the presidential reception. Yeah, that's but idea. yeah, okay. Um, so uh, no, and we, uh, we know that a lot of uh, our members got Pelotons during the pandemic, have done a lot of biking, so we're going to uh, make this available to the membership as well. You won't get the President 2022-23 on it, but, but we will uh, have an email blast and the proceeds will go to the foundation. Uh, and obviously when you're done biking, uh, you're pretty thirsty, yeah. so we got you some custom made. Uh, sets of uh, AAES uh, glasses, and uh, these also will make available to the membership too. Fantastic. So congratulations on a fantastic year. That's great. Thanks,